I'm supposed to be presenting on the value of theological education and partnership. The value of theological education and partnership. The topic will suggest that we are all on the same page on the meaning of theological education. But as I've done some readings, so many people have different ideas of what theological education is. And I wouldn't be surprised if those of us seated here also have uh, different ideas of what theological education is. But I'm hoping that our differences will not be much because we are all Baptists, and I hope that our differences will not be too sharp. Even though I know there will be some differences, I hope that there will be slight differences. There are so many people who construe theological education as something academic. And because of a few things like accreditations that are associated with theological education, people think that theological education has to be something that is non-spiritual. You don't do accreditation for spiritual things, do you? <laughs> so if there is accreditation attached to theological education, then it is something less spiritual. And so some people think theological education uh, at least the formal one done in theological institutions, is not spiritual but purely academic. Uh, for our purpose today, I will be defining theological education uh, in this way. Theological education will be used in this paper to mean the teaching and learning about God with a view to know him intimately and thus to know how to respond appropriately to him and to relate with fellow human beings and to the rest of creation. Now, this is a very general de definition of theological education. It includes both formal theological education, which is done in our theological institutions, and the education that is done uh, in the home, in our churches, informally. What parents teach their children about God read scriptures together and in other informal settings, in churches, all that is part of theological education in the broadest sense. So this is what we'll be using theological education to mean uh, in my presentation. The key task of theological education is to discern whether the life and the work of the believing community truthfully correspond to the vision of God for his world. That's the purpose. Now, I like to read a verse of scriptures, which is very important and related to theological education. We may not see the relationship immediately. John's letter, first letter of John, chapter 2, verse 1, says, My little children, I'm writing these things to you so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. John writes a letter with a purpose. He didn't write a letter simply, let them read and whatever they can make out of it. He writes a letter with a purpose. He says, I write this that you may not sin. But if, you, if any of you does sin, we have an advocate. What liberating message this is that John writes with a purpose. Theological education must be education with a specific purpose. The theological institution, the edu theological educator must have a purpose in what he or she does. The focus of theological, now, the nature and purpose of theological education. The focus of theological education is to form the Christian to be like Christ. This must be our focus and purpose in theological education. The objective is spiritual formation rather than merely passing knowledge and information to individuals. Theological institutions uh, are tempted 
to exempt graduate students from spiritual formation. The assumption is that a student who has done some theological training before is already spiritually mature. So when they come as graduate students to do a master's or to do a PhD, we assume they are mature already, so there's no need for spiritual formation. Now, uh, it's a temptation that many of us uh, fail. I've been in theological education for a long time, and this has also been my assumption. But experience has proven this assumption completely wrong. Churches have their assumptions also. Churches assume that anybody who, who has finished seminary is spiritually mature to lead a church. So a church receives a person believing that the seminary has prepared him or her ready to lead the church spiritually. But the, church, the seminary had its own assumption and the churches have their assumptions. And both assumptions are not right. I think both the churches and seminaries should put these assumptions aside and partner in the spiritual development of people that are in their care at every given time. I, I emphasize this because we do not require in my seminary graduate students to attend chapel. Oh, we assume they know these things already. And I'm sure many of our theological institutions do the same. We require diploma students, we require first degree students to go to chapel and many other requirements. But for graduate students, I think they know. But it is not true. And we need to rethink that uh, as we prepare these persons for ministry. Theological education, like I said, must be focused and the focus must be training persons to be Christ-like. And to achieve this, theological institutions must do the following. There must be commitment to biblical truth. Two, there must be commitment to the Great Commission. There must, and thirdly, there must be commitment to holy living. And then commitment to ministry formation. These Every theological institution must focus on these commitments. I call them fourfold commitments in training. All Christians are called to ministry, and this is usually understood as the ministry of the whole people of God, as we know. Some Christians are called to the ordained ministry, some are called to some other parts of the Christian ministry. But every Christian is called to ministry. And we, we must expect that in their training, we must be focused on what kind of ministry each person has been called to do. Particularity results from Christian identity. Every Christian that is a member of a local church, whether through discipleship, through um, Sunday school training that we do in our churches, through preaching, we are developing the ministers through all these arms of ministry in the church. How are we to evaluate theological institutions and, and their work? Many times we are tempted also to evaluate theological education and theological institutions using the measures that are used in other arenas. Uh, and it will not be accurate to use standards like the marketplace, businesses, uh, entertainment uh, as standards to assess theological education. 
While theological educa educators attempted to use some of these models to assess theological education, we are wrong. It is like using a ruler to measure temperature. Because these are two different things. Theological education should be valued differently. It should be evaluated very differently. Because there's a moral dimension to theological education, which is not found in others. Um, many years ago when I was in the university, um, we had a professor of microbiology. Our very first class, we were art students, but we were required to take a science course as part of the requirement for an arts degree. And this professor was a chain smoker. But in our first class, what he told us was, he held a stick of cigarette in his, between his fingers, and he said, this thing will kill you. But he was smoking it. I said, this thing will kill you. All through the cl class, he held, and for the whole semester that he taught us, there was no time he was in class without a stick of cigarette. He knew what he was teaching. He knew it was wrong. And he was smoking in class. And some years later, even before we finished school, Professor Ajayi died of some lungs problems related to smoking. Theological education is not about giving people something and not living it yourself. Theological education is about you, how you live, how you relate. So the way we assess theological education must be different from the way we assess other forms of education. My wife is a nurse. And we came to seminary many years ago. Part of the training was to train wives of pastors on how to help little children in villages to have good Food because many of them were malnourished. So she was helping the students' wives to make soy milk, which was very rich in protein. And she taught them, and then sometimes she would take the one she prepared in, in my house, which we ate, and she goes to show them, this is the way it is prepared, and this is what it will look like at the end. Then she prepares it, and then they will eat together. And she would say, give this to your children. And they saw their children getting well fed from what she was doing. And uh, then they went and replicated that when they graduated and they went to rural areas. I think theological education should take this kind of form. That we are doing something that first of all has transformed us. And then we are helping other people through education for their lives also to be transformed. Um, theological education has an inherent moral dimension that must be presented in a very authentic way. Theological education should be evaluated by the capacity of each school that is involved in theological education uh, to help students come to terms with the complex and multiple factors that make the moral fabric of the Christian ministry. Some of these factors include the following. We must train our students to understand the nature of the divine Christian ministry. They must understand the nature of the divine call and the divine ministry. Two, students must understand the meaning and the implication of ordination. Students think that ordination is giving them some extra job, that's all. But ordination, our students must understand that ordination goes beyond just giving you an extra job. But that sets you, it sets you apart for a ministry that is very representative. They must understand this. We must make our students understand uh, 
the servant nature of Christian leadership. Many people come to ministry with an idea of leadership that is received from elsewhere. We have seen political leaders, we have seen our government people with different powers, and we think of Christian leadership in the same way. We must train our people to understand servant leadership. Four, they must understand the moral character of the ordained ministry, the moral nature of it. And finally, our students, particularly ours in our Baptist theological institutions, must be properly grounded in the tradition of the Baptist. We, many years ago, now my father was a pastor. And in those days, in the 60s in Nigeria, if, if you were a Baptist, you couldn't go to an Anglican seminary. And my father, he did some training before in the church that he was pastor of. It wasn't a Baptist church. It was Cocking Church in Nigeria, Church of Christ in Nigeria. But then to go for further education, my father went to a Baptist school, a Baptist Bible school, which today I'm the president of. Now when he completed training and he went back to pastor in his church, his church said, no, you cannot go and get training for a, from a Baptist seminary and pastor our church. I thought that was foolish. But the church wanted to preserve their tradition. Sometimes we are a little too careless as Baptist people. We are beginning to lose our tradition. And I think every church denomination must also take seriously why they are who they are. We must take seriously who we are at every given point. In Nigeria today, once uh, Baptist people have their first degree from a Baptist setting, they do the rest of their education elsewhere. And it is okay with us. Uh, Professor Neil Lola is here, and he, you are welcome, sir. He is the president of uh, our patriarchal seminary, uh, the oldest Baptist seminary in Africa, but over 120 years. Um, he, he, has, he has spoken so loudly against this, but the leadership doesn't seem to be as responsive, but I think we need to take this very seriously. If we think there's something about being a Baptist, then our training must show that we take our identity very seriously. And when uh, Dr. Rogers was presenting his paper, he talked about doctrinal integrity. We are losing out in Nigeria in particular, I can't speak for other parts of Africa, but we are losing out in the Nigerian Baptist Convention to neo-Pentecostalism and other movements because we are, even the leadership, the pastors, get some of these things outside of our denominational foundation and heritage. So we must take these very seriously. Although we must also respect other traditions. We must take ours seriously, make sure that our students are properly trained and they understand our uh, denominational positions. How do we evaluate our theological education? The value of theological education. Generally, education leads to the cultivation of intellectual and moral faculties of a person. And they perform better once they are educated. That's general education. But what is theological education supposed to do and on the basis of that? We value it. Theological education from a moral theological institution, from a theological institution, uh, 
open students up to a lot of what the Christian spirituality ought to be. We must inculcate spirituality. We talk of spiritual formation, and this looks like spiritual formation is what we do in Sunday school, is what we do in our discipleship programs. Theological education, if it must, it, it must be theological. It must be very, very abstract and very, very high-sounding theology that means nothing. Uh, we're talking with a friend from South Africa this, this um, during the tea break. And we're talking about practical theology with uh, Yoakam. If theology cannot be put to practice, it is useless. If we cannot practice it, it makes, it has no value. It is an exercise that has no use. It's a waste of time. So my friend uh, Joachim has veered from systematic to practical theology. Was that the reason? <laughs> okay, the value of theological education. We must assess the value of theological education first and foremost by how it meets the needs of the local churches. It's what we are providing in our theological institutions, meeting the needs of our local congregations. Although those needs must also be assessed. The needs must be the right needs too. They must need, meet those needs. Theological education must serve the common good of the denomination. What does it reflect in our teaching the distinctiveness of that denomination? Because most of our theological schools are owned by denominations. If a person comes to our theological institution, now if you come to the Baptist Theological Institution in Kaduna, whether you are Anglican, you are still going to study Baptist distinctives, you are going to study Baptist polity, you are going to do Baptist history, you are going to do everything Baptist. You chose to come. And this is who we are. And I'm sure this is what happens in all our the Baptist theological institutions in Nigeria. We don't exempt you from any cause because you come from a different denomination. We must, theological education, for those of us who are Baptists, must show our distinctiveness for it to have value. It must help to solve the crisis of Christian leadership in the denomination. Providing quality Christian leadership for the denomination. If it does, it has value. It must serve as a vehicle for addressing the great com issues of the Great Commission and culture. We, today we have lots of issues about contextualization how, what needs to be contextualized, how far do we contextualize, and what is left after contextualization. This contextualization is a word that has come. We, we have not taken time to look at the implications of it. We just say contextualize. What does that mean? We all think that we know what con to be contextual means. It's, it's okay, contextualize theology. Okay, contextualize baptism. Contextualize the Lord's Supper. Context, it's easy to say, but what do you do? Uh, the value of theological education is if it is able to help us to deal with these issues. These are not the issues of, of practical theology. Uh, theological education if it has value, must help us resolve these issues of contextualization. Theological education must serve as our mission strategy. I had said earlier that we must train with a focus. 
we must be training missionaries. We are training people who are going to be pastors, who are going to be missionaries. So we, theological education, if it will have value, must be strategically missional. And uh, I had Brother Roger said that later, uh, earlier on. Theological education must also help us apply biblical principles to our communities, families, denomination, application of biblical principles. Um, it must assist graduates to live their Christian life faithfully in their various professions. Not everyone who comes to a theological institution becomes a pastor. So wherever they go, the theological training we have provided them must help them to live their Christian life effectively. Then it has value. If it can't, then it loses value. Nobody comes to theological education in a vacuum. We have all grown up learning some things through church life and theological education therefore should build on the foundations that we had from the things we learned from our parents, the things we learned from church. Theological education must build on that uh, and make us stronger. Theological education also provided, provides uh, an ideal place for vigorous Christian intellectual engagement and character development. Theological education has value when it does that. There are so many things we can say about theological education which will be in the area of value. But value, the highest value of theological education will be that a person has had theological education and has lived that education in his life or her life and has translated it in relating with other people. And we come to partnership in theological education. I think this is the key point of this paper, partnership. It is the plan of God that we should live in partnership. This comes from his own nature. God himself is a partnership. That God is a trinity means that he is in partnership with himself. And his creation reflects this partnership motif. God said it is not good for the man to be alone. So he talks about partnership. He creates the woman so that there will be partnership. The church is about partnership. However we understand the church, the church is about partnership. Paul talks about the church as the body of Christ. He talks about the different parts of the human body as performing different functions, but all for a common good. That's partnership. In fact, Jesus says, church is where two or three Meaning one is not church. So in God's plan, partnership is ingrained in it. God wants us to live in partnership with one another. So theological education is not exempt from this. <clears throat> Christian ministry and theological education are most effectively executed in partnership. There's some work done by um, Zamani Kafang in Nigeria. He talks about partnership in theological education. He looked at six evangelical theological institutions, including Oboma Shop. And he, he looked at how partnership could be done among those theological institutions. What has happened? What is happening? What ought to be? And he made some recommendations about partnership. Professor Ni Lola also has done some work on partnership. He, I read what he did in the Practical Theology Journal that you did uh, on partnership. 
And he made some recommendations also on partnership. Uh, Neil Lola, for instance, talked about partnership in areas like accreditation. We must maintain certain standards. Uh, a few years ago, a theological institution in Kaduna wanted affiliation with a university. And we had also applied to the same university for affiliation. And we'll talk about affiliation later. But the visitation team came to our seminary and they saw our facilities and they, then they took, they asked me to go with them to another institution that had applied. They made me part of the visitation team, but they didn't pay me. <laughs> um, they, and we went to that school. I never heard of the school before in the city of Kaduna. So we went to the school. It was supposed to be a theological institution, but it was using two classrooms of one of our Baptist church schools. And that was all of the seminary. Two classrooms. They had seven students. They had no library. And they had been offering degrees. And now they wanted these degrees affiliated with the university. Now, issues of accreditation are very important. I had said accreditation doesn't sound spiritual. But if we offer theological education, there must be a baseline that it shouldn't be lower than this. If you are offering a certificate, a diploma, this must be the minimum requirement. We expect that these, are, these things must be in place. So we need to collaborate or partner in areas of accreditation. And when Rogers used the word accountability. I expanded that to include accreditation because we must be accountable for the standards that we teach, what we do. So, and we are to be accountable to one another. So accreditation. Uh, Neil Lola recommended accreditation. Uh, we've, we jointly form accrediting bodies or an accrediting body that will regulate standards among us. This is a very important aspect of partnership. Affiliation is another that he recommends. Affiliation will be, there are institutions that are stronger. We have a little bit of this model in the Nigerian Baptist Convention Theological Institutions. Obomasho is the strongest, is not only the oldest, but is also the strongest. It has the facilities, it has the manpower, uh, it has the age behind it. So other theological institutions that are weak affiliate their programs so that they can use the facilities of that institution. And that has been very helpful. We can do the same thing. Networking, collaboration, extension services, those are all aspects of uh, partnership. Now, there's no single theological institution that has all that it needs. And this makes partnership an imperative. Because if we are to achieve our goals, partnership means we can harness our strength. And when we harness our strength, put them together, we will minimize our weaknesses. And this is the whole idea of partnership in theological education. There's a model of partnership that I found very useful that I'm recommending to us to look at and maybe see what we can do in this meeting. I think that it's a very contextual model of partnership among theological institutions. Uh, this is provided by the Association of Theological Institutes in the Middle East. They call it ATIME. 
The association was established in 1967 with the following objectives. Working to strengthen the brotherly relationships between the members. Two, encouraging the spirit of cooperation and mutual understanding among the academic bodies and among the institutes themselves. Exchanging information and creating forums of discussion between member, members of the association. Studying uh, the relationship between theological education and the present situation of the churches of the member bodies. Improving theological education and supporting the theological institutes to achieve their goals. Supporting and financing publication of theological materials. Establishing brotherly relationship with similar associations outside of the Middle East. Now, this association um, has 20 theological institutions, 12 of them in Egypt, six in Lebanon, one in Syria, and one in Iraq. Uh, now, these institutions have a common situation. One, they are a minority where they find themselves. Their context, their Islamic context, makes them minority. So they have something in common. Resources are not readily available to them. That's something common to all of them. They have to wrestle with issues of Islam and extremism. And that's common to all of them. So these brought them together. Their context provided a platform for them to come together to form this association. And they have, they have succeeded in several uh, areas. The activities of this association, which I'm recommending as a model for us here for partnership, is regular meetings of deans or directors or presidents or principals of these institutions, the meeting of professors at local levels. Uh, they also have student meetings. They have meetings of librarians of these institutions. And the librarians of these institutions came up with something very beautiful. They did the following. They introduced all the librarians. The librarians introduced to each other the cataloging system used by the different libraries of all the member institutions. Uh, they have also worked on looking for ways to have more, collabor more collaboration among the librarians, emphasizing the exchange of bulletin and journals among the librarians, among, among the libraries of all the institutions who are members of this association, working on computerizing the libraries in order to relate them by internet, facilitating the use of libraries by all the students of the institutions. And they have had a, they've been able to produce a card that a student from any of the institutions could go into the libraries of any other, all the member institutions without restrictions. So there is a common card that can be used by the students. And they have extended it to faculty members also. To, you can go into these libraries and use. Um, and they have done several other things that have been very helpful in the partnership of this association at Time. This association also intends to achieve the following. Establishing a postgraduate research program common to all the institutions. Now the deans or the heads of these institutions as they meet, they think of what they need so that not each institution is doing the same thing, but they get something that is common to all of them and then let one institution start it that has the capacity and then all of them will be part of that, making contributions either through uh, faculty or... In Nigeria, um, Professor Neil Lola is here. What we have among our theological institutions is that almost each one of them wants to do everything the other is doing. 
and we don't have the resources, we don't have the manpower. Uh, Obama Shaw has the doctoral program. Uh, it has gone through all through the line. Now, Kaduna wants to do, is up to the master's level now. They are thinking one day they will also do the doctoral program. That will mean of us stretching themselves. But if we have a partnership that, instead of starting a doctoral program in Kaduna, we are satisfied that one of our institutions does the doctoral program and we all benefit from it. One of the institutions specializes in missiology and all of us benefit from it. Instead of every institution wanting to do everything, this is what Atime has achieved in starting a program that will benefit all the members without each member wanting to uh, duplicate what the other is doing. Acquiring funds, some of the things that they have achieved, acquiring funds to, uh, to allow the theological libraries to be connected by internet. They've been able to connect all the libraries by internet, working more effectively on the principle of professor's exchange. They have had this professorial exchange in their programs. They keep organizing conferences to discuss uh, and study the curricula of the institutions. And this they have done very effectively. Now this model has worked in the Middle East. Do we Baptists in Africa have a situation, and I think we do, that will bring us together in working, maybe learning something from this partnership of Atime and working something that is more appropriate for ourselves uh, through this vision that we have today. The nature of theological education makes collaboration and partnership an imperative. No theological institution has all the financial and human resources to do all that it desires to do. Therefore, partnership should be a strategic approach to achieving desired goals. This gathering at Brackenhorst Center to, from today is, a momentous, is so momentous to all of us Baptists on the African continent and if we are all willing to harvest this opportunity, it will be the better for all of us as we partner together in theological education. Thank you.